Okay, so officially now we're going to get started. Welcome once again to our webinar this morning. We're going to take a few minutes. Uh, my, ca my colleague Kathy Mincy is going to walk us through some of the logistics so that you understand how the, how the program software and platform works, and then we'll open the meeting and get started. The microphone. I just have a few instructions to make the webinar experience go a little bit more smoothly. And the first one is, if you have external speakers, you'll want to make sure to adjust the volume on those external speakers. And in addition to that, you may also need to adjust the volume of your computer by clicking the speaker icon at the bottom right of your toolbar. And click and drag that up or down, and make sure that mute is not selected. You will have a choice of a couple of different views on this webinar. So you, will cl you can click at the top of your screen to go to full screen view if you'd like to see the, the uh, slides in full screen view. Or you can stay in the current view that you're seeing now. Note that if you go to full screen view, view you will not see the question and answer pod. Although it's unlikely that this should happen, but if your computer should freeze up, try one of the following options. Either try refreshing the screen, or toggle back and forth between full screen view and regular view, or if neither of these works, then just close your browser window and log back in using the URL that uh, we have given you to for this room. There will be a time for question and answers uh, at the end of the presentation. But we won't be responding during the presentation because we don't want you to miss anything while you're composing questions. And also, it's impossible to monitor the questions and keep up with the flow of the presentation. When we do have time for questions, you'll be typing a question here into this question and answer pod and hitting Enter to submit your question. You will either receive a verbal response, or you may receive an individual response here in this question and answer pod. The presentation will be monitored at all times, so if you're having any technical issues, if you would just type a description of your problem into the Q&A pod, we'll do our best to try to resolve the issue. And we're looking forward to a great webinar experience. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much, Kathy. I want to thank you all for signing on today and say good morning or good afternoon to everyone. My name is Tricia Petruni. I'm a senior technical officer for FHI 360's research utilization team. I'll be your facilitator for today's webinar. The purpose of our meeting is to address the implications of the evidence on hormonal contraception and HIV and the related WHO technical statement, and not just for research scientists, policymakers, and healthcare workers, but also for women themselves. We've gathered several experts to help us the topic after you to participate in an interactive discussion session. Okay, it seems that we lost audio there for just a moment. I'm sorry about that. I was just running through an overview of the objectives and the agenda for today, which you can see on the screen. So I'm not going to set up any further by, by repeating what we might have missed. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our welcoming speaker, Ellen Starbird, who's the Director of the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID. 
Ellen has worked for USAID for 23 years and was the deputy director of the office for the last seven years. She's kindly going to get us started. So Ellen, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, as was just noted, I'm Ellen Starbird, the director of the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID. Thank you very much for joining us for this important webinar on hormonal contraception and HIV. What do the evidence and WHO technical statement mean for programs? The presentations you will hear today will give you an overview of the evidence on hormonal contraception and HIV acquisition, progression, and transmission considered at the 2012 WHO technical consultation on this issue. A summary of the guidance resulting from that meeting and thoughts regarding the programmatic implications of that guidance for contraceptive clients, healthcare workers, program managers, and policymakers. In light of current evidence, the 2012 expert consultation concluded that women living with HIV or at high risk of HIV can safely use all methods of hormonal contraception to prevent unintended pregnancy, and recommended that women at high risk of HIV particularly those using injectable contraception, be advised to also always use male or female condoms or other HIV preventive measures. However, determining whether use of various hormonal contraceptive methods impacts HIV-related risks, particularly a woman's risk of HIV acquisition, remains a critical research area for women's health. I'd like to open this webinar by reviewing some data on HIV and contraceptive use among women worldwide that we should use as a platform when thinking through programmatic implications. This map shows the most recent global HIV prevalence rates available. Worldwide, there are about 17 million women infected with HIV. As you know, Sub-Saharan Africa has been the most impacted by the HIV pandemic as indicated by the darker blue colors on this map. In this region, 23.5 million people, of whom 58% are women, are living with HIV, and there are 1.8 million new infections every year. Continuing to expand our efforts in HIV prevention is absolutely critical and can save lives and protect communities from the devastating effects of this virus. Next slide, please. Prevention of unintended pregnancies also saves lives and protects communities. 86 million un unintended pregnancies occur each year, and these contribute to maternal and infant morbidity and mortality and to the preventable pandemic of unsafe abortion. A recent Lancet paper estimated that contraceptive use averted 44% of maternal deaths in 2008. This graphic shows the actual number of maternal deaths that occurred in comparison to the number of maternal deaths that would have occurred in the absence of contraceptive use. Next slide. Contraceptive prevalence and method mix vary greatly by region. Here you see the modern contraceptive prevalence rate by region as indicated by the height of each bar. So in Africa, for example, contraceptive prevalence tends to be lower than other regions. Each bar also shows the contraceptive method mix. So we see that in eastern and southern Africa, injectables, shown in red, represent a large proportion of the overall method mix, while sterilization and or pills, shown in blue or green, tend to dominate in the other regions shown. Injectables offer several important qualities. They are highly effective, relatively long-acting, can be used covertly, and can be easily provided by community health workers, which is an important way of expanding services to underserved populations. Next slide. The question that scientists in the reproductive health and HIV fields have struggled with the most is whether injectable contraception may increase a woman's risk of HIV acquisition. This map shows us the countries in which high rates of HIV coincide with high rates of injectable contraceptive use largely in eastern and southern Africa, shown in red. While research continues to help us obtain further clarity regarding the potential impact of injectables on HIV acquisition, the global health community will need to work together to balance this concern with the need for provision of safe, effective, accessible, and acceptable life-saving contraceptive methods. Next slide. 
This webinar is an important opportunity to discuss how programs can meaningfully implement the WHO guidance on hormonal contraception and HIV, and how we can continue to make progress in ensuring sexual and reproductive health around the world. Thank you to FHI for organizing this important seminar, and to all of our participants for joining us today. Thank you so much, Ellen. We would like to, in turn, thank USAID for supporting this webinar today. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move right on to our um, next speaker. Dr. Chelsea Polis is a senior epidemiological advisor in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID and holds an associate appointment in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. One major focus of her work has involved examining relationships between hormonal contraception and HIV. She recently collaborated with the WHO and the CDC to conduct three systematic reviews on hormonal contraception and HIV acquisition, progression, and female-to-male -male transmission. Today, Chelsea is going to set the stage for our discussion about programmatic implications of the evidence by walking us through the data and providing an overview of the research to date. Chelsea? Great. Thank you so much, Tricia. And hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I really would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. So as you've heard, today's webinar is intended to focus on the programmatic implications of the evidence and of the WHO technical statement on hormonal contraception and HIV. Today, I'll very briefly summarize some of the epidemiological data considered by the expert committee at the WHO meeting in order to set the stage for that broader discussion. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start by unpacking a little bit the terminology that we use. Many of us use the phrase hormonal contraception and HIV, but we should really try to remain aware of two things. First, the term hormonal contraception refers to different types of methods which may have different biological effects. So we can't assume that oral contraceptive pills and injectables and implants all have the same relationship with HIV-related risks. So in discussing this issue, we should try as much as possible to be specific about what methods we're referring to. And second, there are actually four distinct questions of interest here. So the most widely discussed question is, does use of hormonal contraception increase the risk of HIV acquisition for an HIV-negative woman? And as Ellen mentioned, this is an incredibly important question, and I'll be spending most of my time on it today. But there are three other important questions which relate to women who are living with HIV, whose reproductive health needs must not be forgotten. So for example, does using a method of hormonal contraception impact the risk that she will transmit HIV to a male sexual partner? or the risk that her own HIV disease will progress more quickly to AIDS or death? And finally, if she's using antiretroviral therapy and a method of hormonal contraception, are drug interactions expected? So today, I won't be reviewing data for that last question on drug interactions, but I'd be very happy to answer questions about it afterwards, as I do think it actually raises some interesting programmatic issues. So my colleagues and I at CDC and WHO conducted three systematic reviews of the first three issues shown on this slide to identify and summarize available evidence for the WHO meeting. Next slide, please. Interpreting observational data can be challenging since even very well done observational studies can be vulnerable to forms of bias, such as confounding. Most of the studies that we identified in our systematic literature search contained serious methodological flaws, so we established minimum quality criteria and focused only on those studies that met our criteria, which we believed um, would give us a clearer look at the best available evidence. So among the 20 studies that we identified on hormonal contraception and HIV acquisition, only eight met our minimum quality criteria. And of these, seven assessed oral contraceptives, which is what you see on this graphic. So in this graphic, each horizontal line that you see represents a study's 95% confidence interval and each diamond represents a relative risk estimate for the effect of oral contraceptive pills on HIV acquisition. So diamonds that are trending towards the right suggest increased risk of HIV acquisition with use of oral contraceptive pills, while diamonds trending towards the left suggest decreased risk. And if the confidence interval touches that gray vertical line in the middle, 
the study did not find a statistically significant association. So you can see here that the findings were inconsistent with the estimates going in both directions. And from an epidemiological perspective, this evidence does not appear to demonstrate a clear increase in HIV risk with oral contraceptive pills. Instead, the distribution of estimates that you see here could be interpreted as natural statistical variation around no effect. Next slide, please. So among, as I mentioned, we identified 20 studies. Among them, eight met our minimum quality criteria. And all eight of those assessing injectables are shown here on this slide. Hefron 2012, which was the only study conducted among serodiscordant couples, reported a doubling in risk with injectables. And that includes either DMPA, sometimes called Depo-Provera, or NET-N, which is another type of injectable. Dayton 2007 reported a 73% increase in risk with DMPA with narrower confidence intervals. Morrison 2010 reported a statistically significant 48% increase in risk with DMPA under one statistical model, but a non-significant increase under another. The other five studies reported non-significant effects. Some people view the DMPA estimate for Morrison 2012 as approaching statistical significance, but this study had by far the largest number of endpoints and statistical power compared to studies like Hefron 2012 and Kleinschmidt 2007, which contained 10 or 11 women who seroconverted while using injectables. Only three studies had estimates specific to NET-N, as shown with the diamonds. None of those studies on NET-N found a significant effect, but obviously the evidence for this method is limited. So in sum, data on injectables, especially for DMPA, are mixed and difficult to interpret. Next slide, please. For HIV uninfected women, the data do not suggest an increased risk of HIV acquisition with use of oral contraceptive pills, nor with use of NET-N, although the data for NET-N are limited. We have very limited or no data on how methods such as implants, patches, rings, or hormonal IUDs may or may not impact the risk of HIV acquisition. On the other hand, there's substantial uncertainty around DMPA, and some studies suggest a potential increased risk of HIV acquisition with use of this method. If this association is causal, the magnitude could range from a modest effect to a doubling in risk. Any potential HIV acquisition risk must be balanced against risks of unintended pregnancy, including maternal morbidity and mortality, unsafe abortion and infant mortality, as well as any potential increase in risk of HIV acquisition, which may possibly be associated with pregnancy itself. Next slide, please. Our colleagues at Imperial College London have done some modeling work to try to clarify this balance of risks and benefits. So under the assumption that DMPA does increase the risk of HIV, they modeled what would happen if DMPA use ended in terms of additional maternal mortality versus averted HIV mortality. And they conclude that unless the true effect size for DMPA approaches a relative risk of 2.19 or more than double, Reductions in injectable contraception are unlikely to result in an overall public health benefit, but with the possible exception of those countries in southern Africa with the largest HIV epidemics, shown here in green. Next slide. Concerns about a possible increase in HIV acquisition with some hormonal contraceptive methods, plus substantial uncertainty in the body of evidence, plus the life-saving benefits of hormonal contraception, leaves us in a public health conundrum that concerns are greatest around DMPA intensifies this conundrum, because in some regions, DMPA is among the only very effective, accessible, and acceptable contraceptive methods. Next slide, please. Looking forward, looking towards the future of data on this issue, Um, who's speaking? But who's supposed to be speaking? Chelsea, can you try reconnecting your audio? I think we lost your audio. Can you please reconnect your audio? We are not able to hear you right now. 
several new stuff. Hi, can you hear me again? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Um, could you give me a sense of where it cut out? About 30 seconds ago. <laughs> OK. Um, should I start from this slide? Yes, yes. You had just said about talking about the newly published data. OK, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. So looking forward to the future of data on this issue, several new studies are on the horizon. And all of the evidence that was published since the 2012 WHO con technical consultation will be incorporated at the next WHO consultation. In addition, we recently held an expert meeting to develop recommendations for future observational analyses, which we hope will contribute towards continuing to improve the observational evidence base. And finally, discussions are ongoing regarding the feasibility of conducting a randomized controlled trial on this issue. Next slide, please. Enabling women living with HIV to prevent unintended pregnancy addresses women's needs and is an absolutely essential component in reducing perinatal HIV. So I wanted to mention the evidence around hormonal contraception and HIV transmission as well as HIV disease progression. And very, very briefly, the data essentially suggests that HIV-infected women can use hormonal contraception without concerns related to HIV disease progression. Questions remain with respect to whether hormonal contraception, especially injectables, may increase the risk of transmission to a male partner. As rollout of antiretroviral therapy increases, any such increase in risk of transmission with hormonal contraception would likely strongly be decreased. Regardless of the contraceptive method used, HIV-infected women should be counseled about the importance of combining hormonal contraception with effective HIV prevention interventions, such as condoms and ART initiation. Next slide, please. In conclusion, in regions with high HIV risk and use of injectable contraception, understanding the relationship between hormonal contraception and HIV acquisition is one of the most important questions in women's health today. Given concerns about a potential association between DMPA and HIV acquisition, more evidence is needed on highly effective contraceptive alternatives. For a woman living with HIV, she can use hormonal contraception without concern related to HIV disease progression. But more data are needed on the question of transmission to men, including within the context of ART use. Finally, communicating what we know and what we don't yet understand to women, couples, and providers is absolutely critical. And I'm really looking forward to your discussion on how best to accomplish that within the programmatic setting. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to thank all of you very much for your attention today. And I'd like to acknowledge the many individuals and organizations who are listed on this slide, as well as the women and men who have participated in the studies advancing our understanding on this very complex subject. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, and to everyone listening, thank you for your patience as we try to troubleshoot some audio um, issues as we go along. I think we have them resolved. But um, thanks again for your patience. And, and really, thank you, Chelsea, for breaking down this, this really complex data in a way that lay people like myself and others can understand. It's, it's a brilliant talent, and we appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker um, today, Dr. Sharon Phillips trained as a family physician in New York and completed subspecialty trainings in contraception and abortion. She currently works as a medical officer in the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at the World Health Organization. Sharon's going to orient us to the WHO response to the current evidence on the relationship between hormonal contraception and HIV. Sharon. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Next slide, please. So the first, the first thing I wanted to go over is just an explanation of what exactly the medical eligibility criteria is. Um, so the medical eligibility criteria was initially, um, initially formed in the mid-90s. And it's meant to provide guidance on the safety of the use of different contraceptive methods for women with specific characteristics or medical conditions. 
Um, all of the guidance is based on systematic reviews of clinical and epidemiological research, so it's all evidence-based. Um, the intended audience of the MEC is program managers, policymakers, and the scientific community, and it's meant to inform national policies and guidance. Um, it's updated every four to five years, but interim guidance is provided as needed when new, um, new information comes out that might change our guidance, then we will occasionally have um, an interim technical consultation. And the consultation on hormonal contraception and HIV was one of those interim consultation, consultations. Next slide, please. So, as it, so the organization of the MEC, um, everything is organized by contraceptive methods. So there is a section on combined hormonal contraceptives, which includes oral contraceptive pills and combined injectable contraceptives. Mm -hmm. Um, and then within each of those sections, it's, it's split up by patient characteristics and pre-existing conditions. So patient characteristics would be something like age, whether they're a smoker, whether they're at high risk for HIV, and then pre-existing or medical conditions would be something like hypertension, epilepsy, living with HIV. Um, and the criteria use a numeric scheme to provide the recommendations. Next slide, please. So the way the numeric scheme works is it's a one to four scheme that we've been using for the last 15 years. Um, so one is a condition for which there's no restriction for the use of the contraceptive method. Two is a condition where the advantages of using the method generally outweigh the theoretical or proven risk. Um, and we kind of call these the, this the green zone. One and two is generally this method should, is safe for use. For three, is a condition where the theoretical or proven risks usually outweigh the advantages of using the method. But there might be some situations where, for that individual, using the method would be the best choice. Um, and for number four, is that better? Can you hear me better now? Okay. For no, and number four is a condition that represents an unacceptable health risk if the contraceptive method is used. So generally, um, generally, you wouldn't want to use the method if it's a four um, for someone who has that condition. Next slide, please. So as I said, we sometimes issue interim guidance, and the guidance on, H on hormonal contraception and HIV was interim guidance. We had a meeting more than a year ago. Um, the purpose of this technical consultation was to review the current MAC guidelines for the use of hormonal contraception in light of the new evidence and also to determine if a change in the MEC was required. We reviewed all hormonal contraceptive methods, which, as Chelsea mentioned, includes oral contraceptive pills and progestin-only injectables. Um, and the conditions that we reviewed were women at high risk of HIV and women living with HIV. Next slide. So Chelsea has already alluded to these questions. Basically, these are the questions that we looked at. Um, does hormonal contraception increase the risk for HIV acquisition in HIV-negative women? So that is looking at women who are at high risk of HIV. And then numbers two and three were, um, does hormonal contraception um, increase the risk of, of HIV disease progression in HIV-positive women or HIV transmission to non-infected male partners? And those were the two questions that related to women who are living with HIV. Next slide. Next slide, please. So first I'm going to talk about HIV acquisition in um, women who are HIV negative. Next slide. So Chelsea's already talked about the evidence, but the conclusions that we came to were that an increased risk was unlikely with OCPs, which is oral contraceptive pills, and with NET-N, which is a kind of progestin-only injectable um, that is similar to DMPA but, or Depo-Provera, but, but has some qualities that are different. So we concluded that the increased risk was unlikely with those methods, but concluded that the data was inconsistent regarding a risk with DMPA or unspecified injectables, as Chelsea discussed in the evidence. Next slide, please. So our new MEC recommendation was slightly changed. We did not change the recommendation for combined oral contraceptives, combined injectable contraceptives, or progestin-only pills. 
Um, it's still a one, which means it's recommended for everybody. We did not change the, the recommendation for patch or ring, which is still a one. Um, for DMPA and net N, we did add a clarification. So the number stayed a one, but we added a clarification, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And for implant, we left that as a one. Um, and so that was unchanged. So the only change that was made after that meeting was a change in the clarification. Our guidance includes both a number and a clarification in some cases. So our guide, so both of those together are the guidance. Next slide, please. So the clarification is quite long, but um, just focusing on the text in red, we said because of the inconclusive nature of the body of evidence on possible increased risk of HIV acquisition, women using progestogen-only injectable contraceptives should be strongly advised to always also use condoms, male or female, and other HIV preventive measures. Um, so we wanted to highlight the uncertainty and make sure that program managers were aware that we were we we felt that that we were uncertain about where, what the evidence was saying. That although we didn't feel the evidence merited changing the number, we did feel that a clarification was needed to make sure that that we relayed those concerns. Next slide. So the other two questions about were are regarding um, whether hormonal contraception increases a risk of HIV disease progression and HIV transmission. Next, please. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So basically, this is the category in the MEC that looks at HIV, um, looks at looks at the risk of hormonal contraceptives for women living with HIV. Next slide. So overall, after we reviewed the evidence, we we concluded that the new evidence regarding HIV disease progression was consistent with the prior evidence and was generally reassuring. Um, and though we did find that there was one study with direct evidence regarding HIV disease transmission to male partners, um, it was limited to one study, but it did suggest an increased risk with use of injectables. Next slide. Although we did have that one study showing increased risk with injectables for transmission, it did not change any of our recommendations. So our new MEC recommendation for all of the hormonal contraceptive methods for women living with HIV is a one for all categories of contraceptives. So there were no changes, and we didn't include any clarifications. All that changed was our statement of the evidence. Next slide. So the only other caveat is, as Chelsea mentioned, women on um, antiretrovirals may require some special consideration regarding the use of hormonal contraceptives because there are some potential drug interactions. We did not review that at the meeting. Um, that will be reviewed again at our next, our next MEC meeting next year. Um, but that is, that is something that we do have guidance on and that will be re-reviewed. But it was not reviewed last year. And I think that I'm done. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sharon. We appreciated that overview of the WHO technical guidance and, again, distilling um, a fairly complex um, topic down into a, a very short presentation. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, I'm really pleased to introduce Lillian Morico who is a social worker by training and is currently the regional coordinator for the International Community of Women Living with HIV uh, Eastern Africa. She has more than 10 years of experience working in HIV AIDS, including serving as the vice chair of the Uganda Country Coordinating Mechanism for the Global Fund, and as a member of the task force who challenged HIV-related travel restrictions and succeeded in lifting travel bans to countries including the U.S. Lillian is really well known for working passionately towards ensuring that all people enjoy their full rights, including access to information, education, services, and social justice. So now that we've been reoriented to the, the science and the technical guidance, we invited Lillian to share with us some of the perspectives on this issue from women living with HIV so that we can better understand what women actually want and need with regard to information and services on this topic that will help them make informed decisions about their comprehensive sexual and reproductive health. So Lillian, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Am I on? 
So I yes. be, oh, thank you. So I'm speaking on the topic in the absence of definitive evidence and in light of the WHO guidance, what types of information, support or services do women at risk of or living with HIV want and need now from the global donor policy and service community? And I would like to start from where my two colleagues have just uh, ended. And uh, in terms of the clarification, I would like to start by saying that the World Health Organization and the team of experts at the February meeting 2012 did not mean much. The, the, the clarification that was given, the, the statement from our point of view as women did not, not mean much by adding any clarification to the previous classification of progestin on injectable contraception, contraception for women at high risk of HIV infection uh, without changing the grade. And uh, the previous speaker has already talked about the medical eligibility criteria, so I may not get into the detail of that. But the technical statement doesn't mean much to service providers, and so is to women at high risk of HIV or women living with HIV. World Health Organization knows this very well, that people who are on ground and providing services are guided by the medical eligibility criteria, which my colleague has talked about. And to service providers, they derive the meaning and guidance from the grading within the MEC, which unfortunately, the February famous meeting, of which I happen to have been part of, struggled to change to no avail. And it was clear from the meeting, especially by those who have been close to WHO and to this grading system, that the clarification that was added on the grading wasn't going to make any change. And we indeed have found this to be true, especially in my country, Uganda, where as ICW, as the International Community of Women Living with HIV, together with AVAC, between April and May 2012, conducted interviews with the big four family planning and reproductive health services, service providers with a view of understanding their perspective of the World Health Organization recommendation on hormonal contraception and HIV risk, establishing whether and how they were made aware of the recommendation and how and whether they were able to communicate to their lower level centers and their interpretation and take home of the WHO statement. Even though they were all aware about the findings of the, of the HEFRON study and about the WHO recommendation, the service providers had not adjusted in any way of doing their work and had no plans to change their programs or act on the WHO recommendation. They claim that the guidance did not change, that is the make, and that they would only adjust their operations if the guidance in the medical eligibility criteria had changed. To them, the clarification was just for advocacy and could be done away with. They further said they would continue to counsel women and couples just like they had always done about the importance of family planning and the consistent use of condoms, even when using hormonal or non-hormonal family planning methods for prevention of HIV and other STIs. And they had no intentions of communicating the HIV perceived risk to women using DIPO because they claimed it would cause many women to abandon the method and hence family planning because that's all they have as their method of choice. What we also know, especially at the communities under the ground, about this clarification is that it is wishful thinking. Because most of the parts of the world, especially where we come from in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and where hormonal contraception is offered, we know that also our health care system is struggling with a skeleton health care workforce that is ill-motivated and therefore not able to offer all full information to all women and girls that come to the health facilities. But we also know globally that there is limited supply, access, and use of condoms, especially by women due to several reasons that have been said over and over again. If women at risk and living with HIV were able to use condoms and consistently 
they probably would have no reason to go for family planning and for that case, injectables. And therefore, the recommendation to women using progestin on injectable contraception to also use female and male condom, in my opinion, is a limitation and failure of the technical expert meeting and WHO policy and programmers and by failing to have an answer that is conclusive but also providing options that are safe and effective to women until definitive and conclusive evidence is put on table. So what do we want as women at risk and women living with HIV? Women at risk or living with HIV would like in the first place to have conclusive evidence on whether or not there is a relationship between hormonal contraception and HIV risk. The absence of evidence does not necessarily mean there is no relationship and for that matter, no cause to worry. I also recall at the May WHO 2012 meeting, one participant of the meeting reminding us that the, laws, the law requires that where you are in doubt, it is better to take the side of caution. Unfortunately, WHO, the global community and donors have decided not to hear to this course of direction. And therefore, to get out of this vicious cycle, we need a fast-tracked research to produce conclusive results on hormonal contraception use and HIV risk. Women would like to be placed at the center of the entire debate within the HIV and reproductive health sectors. We want, to debate, we want the debate to take into consideration our sexual reproductive health and rights and needs, and women would like to be seen as a whole with our different needs, desires, choices, and to be seen in our diversities of mothers, partners, sex workers, grandmothers, daughters, sisters, carers, black, white, rich and poor, literate and illiterate. I would like to restate two of the recommendations made by the meeting of expert women from five African countries of Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe at the February 2012 meeting in Uganda in preparation for the technical expert meeting by WHO in the same month. The recommendations were presented at that meeting of uh, experts in February. They were repeated at the WHO May 2012 meeting, and we said this over and over. And women say that they don't want to be divided by issues of various risks. The response cannot pit contraceptives versus maternal mortality. We don't accept an either or approach. Both problems need to be addressed because they affect us as women. And this was also re-echoed by the AVAC partners at the Partners Forum in December 2012, when they said women should not have to choose to die in childbirth or from HIV. Women want and deserve full information, including clear explanation of the current data, what is known and not known. Women must be told and counseled about the potential risks of hormonal contraceptive use and HIV and be led to make informed decisions. Women should be involved in an ongoing manner in discussion, communication, strategies, and decisions on this important topic of debate. But the question that still remains, does anybody care to listen? Does the perspective of women matter on a matter like this one? We want to see an increased access to family planning options for women to choose from. We want to have better non-hormonal, easy to access and use family planning methods to be developed to increase on the basket of choices. We shouldn't be trying one new type of depot, for example, on women like the Sayana Press that is being implemented in Uganda, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and Niger, but instead researching on other new, better options. We want the family planning 2020 commitment for faith. I would like to conclude by, by a saying or a proverb in my country, which says, Nanyinimufu ya kwata wawunya. Literally translated means, if somebody dies and rots, the most close person is the one who touches the part that is burning most. I know the international community, the donors, the technical institutions like WHO and policymakers have the moral responsibility to protect women and girls from an HIV infection that can and must be prevented, especially where in doubt, like in the case of hormonal contraceptive use and HIV risk, and at the same time prevent them from maternal mortality, but often than not, don't abide by this, and therefore, Women and girls of this world, and more importantly from the crop of South, where these products are being administered and coincidentally where the HIV prevalence is the highest and of course highest among women, must stand, must 
stand and rise beyond lack of evidence and its inconclusiveness and demand for a change in thinking, action, and demand for better and more options that are not questionable as we wait for definitive evidence. While there is limited evidence and inconclusive data, HIV infection is real, maternal mortality is on the rise, and we must rise beyond this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian. Your remarks highlight so many threads that I hope are going to be picked up in our Q&A and discussion, such as you know, the moral responsibility that the international community has to meeting needs of women, to how to effectively and meaningfully involve women in the discussions about um, changes in, in policies or program design and, and, and services, and a number of other issues. So um, thank you very much for for your remarks. Um, we're going to move on to our final speaker. Um, Dr. Irina Jacobson is an MD and technical advisor in the Global Health Population and Nutrition Department of FHI 360. She has 28 years of clinical experience, including 18 years in the reproductive health field. She's collaborated with many organizations and governments on project implementation, strengthening health service delivery institutions, and development of country-level policies and clinical practice guidelines. Today, Arena is going to discuss more about what the available evidence and guidance mean to programs in the field. And if you'll bear with us one moment, we're going to get her audio back. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you, Trisha, and thank you, everyone, for joining us in this conversation today. Um, so, it's easier to speak when all these issues were sort of addressed, so it's, for me, it's really nice to be able, able to build on it. So when we think about programmatic implications of this research, there are a few things we need to keep in mind. First, access to both HIV prevention and to family planning is critically important for both individual and public health. Family planning is still one of the major factors when it comes to lowering rates of maternal and infant mortality and morbidity, and it plays a big role in reducing the number of infants exposed to HIV. It also empowers women to have more control over their reproductive health, which is not a small matter. At the same time, HIV remains a significant public health threat worldwide. Second, we have to always think about risks and benefits. As countries and programs make any adjustments to their approaches, they should keep in mind that as of today, we don't have a conclusive evidence that hormonal contraceptives increase HIV risk. However, benefits of family planning are well documented. Third, communication matters. We may be saying all these measured, well thought through things, but this is what providers may be, so to say, hearing. The idea that hormonal contraception doubles the risk of HIV often overshadows everything else in their minds. For providers to be able to counsel women effectively about the issue, they should have accurate information and a better understanding of comparative risk. It may help to know how pregnancy risks compare to risks of acquiring or transmitting HIV. For example, in developing countries, a woman's lifetime risk of maternal death is about 1 in 150. In some countries, it may be as high as 1 in 100. In addition, for every maternal death, there are about 24 women who suffer long, lifelong health problems related to pregnancy. On top of that, we know that pregnancy itself makes women more vulnerable to HIV. Now, in comparison, risk of HIV transmission after unprotected vaginal sex is pretty low. It's about 0.1% per exposure when a man is positive and the woman is negative, and it is even smaller when the situation is reversed. Even in the worst case scenario, if we assume that hormonal contraception increases risk of transmission twofold, 
HIV risk per exposure still remains very low at 0.2% and 0.13% respectively. Now, let's think how WHO expert guidance affects what providers are currently doing. Let's say they see a woman who is not at risk of HIV. And remember that there are many, many women who are not at risk. So this woman should be able to use any effective contraceptive method of her choice, unless, of course, she has other health issues which may restrict her options. So there is no change from current practice, right? Now, let's say there is a woman who has high ongoing risk of HIV. No matter what method of contraception she wants to use, hormonal or not, if she is not using condoms in addition to another method, it's not an issue of if, but an issue of when she will get infected. So current practice is to counsel these women who are at ongoing risk of HIV about dual protection and dual method use. And again, current expert guidance doesn't change that. But how do we decide who is at risk and who isn't? It seems like helping women to assess their own HIV risk is and will remain the key. We know that both actual risk and risk perception vary significantly depending on country, setting, and population. When women understand their own risk for infection, it helps them to decide on how to protect themselves and others best. There is evidence that self-assessment may be more effective than assessment done by a healthcare provider. When women are told what behavior, situations, and factors may increase risk, they can decide how it applies to them. It works better because self-assessment is much more neutral. It doesn't put a woman on the spot when provider confronts her with very sensitive questions about her or her partner lifestyle, about multiple partners, about her husband's unfaithfulness, and so on. That said, I'm going to name a few programmatic implications, and hopefully we can expand on this list during the discussion that follows. One of the obvious implications is that programs need to train and support providers to be able to offer unbiased, accurate information on contraceptive options, including risks and benefits as it applies to HIV. To be able to empower women to assess the individual risk for STIs and HIV, and to offer effective counseling on dual protection and dual method use. When it comes to dual protection, male condoms are great, but not enough. Female condoms remain very much underutilized, and until female condoms are truly available and affordable, dual protection may not be a realistic option for women whose partners refuse to use male condoms. Programs should also promote male involvement in reproductive health, there are many, many good reasons for that, one being that effective dual protection is not possible without male involvement. In addition, countries and programs should commit to respecting reproductive and human rights and supporting women and couples in making informed voluntary choice. Women should be able to choose from a wide range of effective contraceptive options, so increasing access to more methods including reintroduction of underutilized methods such as IUDs should be one of the priorities. And finally, because there is often a big overlap between women's family planning needs and needs for HIV-related services, programs may consider integrating this too as much as possible. So I'll stop here and hopefully we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. I'm now actually going to open the floor to questions or comments from the participants. So you can please uh, use the Q&A chat box to the right of your screen to type in your questions for the guest experts or any general comments that you would like to share. If your question is aimed at a particular guest expert, please do indicate that. Also, as you submit your reflections, please be aware that we are recording this event and it will be made available publicly online. If you'd prefer a private response to your questions, please also indicate that to me. So as you begin to type your questions and, and they come in, I'm going to open the floor with one for any of our, our speakers to respond to. Um, so for me, the fundamental question here is really about how to empower women and their partners to make informed choices about their sexual and reproductive health. 
women should be given the information that they require to make these decisions, including about the expanding options available for safer conception in pregnancy and about the dual risks from unprotected sex of unintended pregnancy and HIV. I think everyone probably agrees that it's critical to do this. The rub really comes in when deciding how to do this. So for example, Arena talked about the data on a woman's high lifetime risk of maternal death in developing countries. And in fact, a new meta-analysis of 23 studies shows that women living with HIV have eight times the risk of a pregnancy-related death in sub-Saharan Africa compared to women without HIV, and that an estimated one in four pregnancy-related deaths in Africa are attributable to HIV. Yet, we're not asking providers to share those statistics and that data with women who are planning to become pregnant. Rather, the point there is to ensure that a woman and her partner know about and have access to the best possible health services to support them through a healthy pregnancy and delivery. So in this issue of how much and what type of information clients need to ensure they can make their own well-informed decisions becomes even more complex for topics like hormonal contraception and HIV, which requires a careful discussion of risks and benefits, but for which there's also a fair degree of uncertainty. Nevertheless, as both Chelsea and Lillian pointed out, communicating our understanding and what we don't yet understand to women and couples and, and providers is critical. So once again, the question isn't so much what we need to do, but how to do it. So for this really nuanced issue that I've seen even researchers and other experts struggle to address succinctly, what should we actually be doing right now to effectively equip frontline workers to deliver accurate, comprehensive information and messages to women and their partners. What will doing that really take from the international community, governments, and partners? So I'll invite any of our guest speakers who have some thoughts on this issue to, to please chime in while we start to queue up the questions from our participants. So maybe Arena or Sharon, if you have any um, any reflections or, or advice on, on this question of how we actually get this information and some clear guidance across to providers on what they should or should not be changing in their practices. Um, well, I'll try to address that. Well, I, I sort of try to imply it in my presentation, I don't think that our current knowledge, or even if we do prove that um, injectables increase the risk of HIV acquisition, th that's sort of, of course, women should be aware of that if that's the case. But on a large scale, it doesn't really change what she is going to do in addition to to any contraceptive method. Let's say she is choosing IUD, which has no implications in terms of HIV transmission or acquisition, and she is at the risk of HIV. She still needs to use additional contraceptive method, and probably it will be male or female condom at, at this point, to protect herself. Because if she is at risk, it doesn't matter if she is using injectable or any other method, she will need to protect herself. So. Operationally, nothing changes. She may still go for method that doesn't increase chances if, let's say, condom wasn't used. It's somewhat less of a chance that she will acquire HIV. But women who is at ongoing risk, it, you know, there is no way around it. Now, women who are not at risk and may be accidentally exposed once in their lifetime. Remember, risk of HIV acquisition, even if it is doubled from one-time exposure, is extremely, extremely low. So I don't think it really warrants. Again, it's women's choice. We should counsel them, and they should be aware of that. But it's, in my mind, it doesn't warrant like, eliminating injectables from method mix for women who are not at risk of HIV, and maybe sometime in their life they will come uh, in contact with men who is infected. Um, so dramatically, it doesn't change how we approach 
contraceptive counseling other than maybe nuancing around uh, dual protection with a little more emphasis for those women who are using, using injectables which potentially may increase risk. Great. Thanks, Irina, for getting us started. Um, I'm going to uh, begin with the next question, um, more related to the, the scientific evidence before moving into some of the program-related questions. Uh, we have one participant question, I think, for either Chelsea or Sharon. Did the authors of the systematic review conduct a meta-analysis? And if not, what were the reasons for that? Hi, this is Chelsea. I'll be happy to take that question. So we did a systematic review, um, and as is typical, we looked through all of those studies to look at um, the heterogeneity, the, the kind of um, variation in the ways that those studies um, tried to answer this question, the techniques that they used in terms of statistical models, et cetera, things like that. And what we really saw was that um, the studies approached this question in many different ways. Um, you know, including using different comparison groups in, in terms of who they were comparing hormonal contraceptive users against, um, in terms of using different statistical models to control for different variables, et cetera. So lots of different ways of, of trying to get at this answer. Um, so the, the populations they used were also different. So we have different populations being looked at, different methods being used. And then as you saw on some of the slides, there was a lot of difference in terms of the um, the relative risk estimates that were generated. So we determined, and this is quite, you know, very much in line with um, uh, expert guidance on the conduct of meta-analysis, that when you have an extreme degree of heterogeneity, um, it may, especially when you're looking at observational studies, meaning studies where you're not randomizing women to use one method or another, um, it tends to be a bit of a judgment call in terms of whether it's uh, appropriate to conduct a, 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 a statistical meta-analysis. So in our case, we decided that it wasn't appropriate um, at this time. Um, there are some folks who are working on potentially doing um, a statistical meta-analysis, and I've been in communication with them to really try to help um, uh, enhance what their own um, desire really is, which is to, to attempt to do a statistical meta-analysis, but to really try to ensure that they are couching it in very careful terminology and, and you know, a very careful way of presenting it. Because uh, meta-analysis of observational studies can be such a dicey issue. Um, so we, we chose not to do it in the systematic reviews, but there you know, may potentially be some work coming out on that in the future from folks with a slightly different take. Thanks, Chelsea. We actually have a follow-up question for you, um, a question of clarification. How do we assess whether there is an increased or decreased public health benefit when we take away DMPA as an option? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Thanks very much for that question. And I think this really speaks, I was, I was really glad to hear um, Lillian make the point that as women, we really want to see um, our health needs approached in a very holistic sense, and we need to not think about these as very siloed issues. And I think that that um, is where these modeling studies can really come into play. And, and I think the, the slight discrepancy that I heard in some of the things that she said is, is this, this idea about erring on the side of caution. And I think once we really look at the data from these modeling studies, it becomes a little less clear what erring on the side of caution is. So for example, um, you might remember in one of the slides that I showed, um, there was modeling work done by our colleagues at Imperial College London. And when, what they essentially did was they looked at, if we assume that the actual increase in risk for HIV acquisition with injectables is a doubling in risk, if we assume that that is the case, and then we look at what would happen if we remove injectables from the market and replace that with um, alternate methods with uh, what they did was use a, kind of an average of effectiveness for a different contraceptive method with which that's replaced. So this is kind of creating this, this scenario to see what would then happen in terms of rates of maternal mortality, 
um, that would likely be increased due to an increase in unintended pregnancies versus rates of HIV mortality due to that um, assumption of a doubling in risk with the NPA. How do all of those, you know, how did that positive and negative force kind of interact and how does that balance out? And as I showed in one of those slides, the authors of this modeling study concluded that essentially in, in most of the world, it doesn't make public health sense to stop injectables. In countries like Bangladesh, where there's very high use of injectables but, um, and high maternal mortality, um, but low HIV, we would see a vast increase in maternal deaths um, as a result of, of stopping injectables. On the other hand, when you look in countries where there's high use of injectables, there are high rates of HIV, um, and there are um, and maternal mortality is also high, there may be, um, there, there, in that case, it may make more public policy sense to think about phasing injectables out. So when we think about this question, and, and you know, the WHO guidance is intended as global guidance, which is meant to then be adapted at a country level. So we really have to balance these risks and benefits, not, over, not only, you know, overall by adhering to data and, and looking at what the evidence shows us, but also really thinking about how this will impact countries on an, you know, within their own context and within their own epidemiological um, context. Um, so I hope that answers the question, but, but please let me know if not. Thank you, Chelsea. So we have a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to try to collapse some that are that are similar um, in the interest of time. But I will say, if we don't get to your question in the remaining 15 minutes of our webinar, um, I will share them with the participants. And we will either include it in the ar archived version online, or we'll respond to you directly via email. Um, we have several questions coming in about this idea of um, assessment of a woman's risk. Um, one person asks, if healthcare providers make judgments about a woman's risk, how does that impact their provision of care? And related to that, um, two people have asked if besides provider counseling, are there evidence-based interventions or strategies for helping women and couples accurately assess their own risk of both unintended pregnancy and HIV? So are there strateg evidence-based strategies or even tools for that? Arena, you were speaking about women's ability to, to self-assess. Is there any um, no, reaction you have to those questions? Yes. Um, well, it's, it's basically all about counseling, but there is a study that looked into self-assessment versus provider assessment, where it was shown that, and it was studied not on HIV risk, but on STI around IUD insertion, where providers were assessing clinical symptoms and signs, as well as history and uh, sexual behaviors, and making their own conclusion about women being or not being at risk of STI. And another group of women were the group where provider just presented them with list of behaviors in situation which put them, them at risk of STI, and asked them, do you think of any of this apply to you without asking specifically which one or, you know, can you elaborate on that? So just giving them a menu of options that put them at risk. And, we, and, and do you still think that you're a good candidate for IUD? Because if you have any of these behaviors of risk factors, you may be at risk of infection. So, and women self-selected themselves and group who said, yeah, I'll probably stay away from IUD. And the group that said, oh, sure, I'm a good candidate. So when they compared, actually, they, they did testing in these two groups. <clears throat> it turned out that self-assessment was much more accurate. Women who self-selected into no-risk group really didn't have STIs. And those who selected into risk group, they, they didn't have ST. Not all of them had it, but a large percentage did while provider assessment was way less accurate. So we don't need to like double check in every case, but it's pretty clear that women can deal with applying risk factors to themselves truthfully and deciding um, if they're at risk or not. 
Are they going to be right in every single time? No. But the same could be said about lab assessment. It's not always we can diagnose it. The same can be said about symptoms and signs assessment. We can't really diagnose it 100% of times. So we have to live with imperfections, but self-assessment tend to be more effective than provider-driven assessment. Okay, great. Thank you, Irina. It's a popular topic today in the in the question thread. Um, a, another thing that appears to be on many um, people's minds and it has been on mine for some time has to do with the fact that the the primary recommendations for actions based on the current evidence about the associate, possible associations between hormonal contraception and HIV, things like promoting dual method use and expanding the method mix you know, have really long been goals of the family planning field regardless of the dialogue about the potential relationship with HIV. And the fact that those remain unrealized, I think, speaks to the reality that these are not necessarily easy objectives to, to achieve. So, you know, how or should these additional considerations about HIV be leveraged by advocates and decision makers to help gain support and make some real progress on these broader family planning goals? Um, you know, what are the barriers, for example, to expanding the method mix option in southern Africa, particularly beyond injectables? So I don't know, Lillian or Sharon, if, if you have any thoughts on that? Hi, this is Sharon. Sure, it's expanding method mix, I, I agree, this has been something that family planning advocates have been trying to do for decades. And it's a big problem, and, and it's not easy to solve, or perhaps it would have been solved already. There are issues of provider training. There are issues of provider bias. There are issues of educating women about their options. There are issues of um, supply chain, um, particularly methods like IUDs, that, which are very cost effective over time, but require much more provider training and supplies than something like an injectable. Um, it becomes a lot easier to just give everybody injectables, and and it seems that that people that that programs have been relying on injectables and oral contraceptives almost exclusively in many situations, and that's not right. And women should have women living everywhere should have access to all methods. Um, it shouldn't matter where you live. You know, if you live in Kenya or if you live in the UK, you should have access to the same methods. So this is a problem that's been going on for a long time, and it's not easy to fix. I'm very heartened by um, by the new commitments to family planning that have happened recently, and I'm hopeful that some of these will change. But but none of these are easy problems to solve. Hi, Lydia. Here. This is Chelsea. Oh. Lillian, why don't you please go ahead? Hi. I think for me it is about it's about the commitment that there is to make sure that women from all over the world access the best options that they are in terms of prevention, in terms of care, treatment and support. Uh, and therefore, for me, the history of where we've come from and where we are tells me that we don't seem to have enough commitment toward the health of women. And, and, and I may be wrong, but I, I think this is what it is. Because when I look at the table in terms of what is available, we've been talking about microbicides, We've been talking about female-controlled preventive methods for all this long. We don't have any yet. You can say we have the female condoms, but uh, from where I come from, those are not female-controlled. So we haven't placed the woman at the place where they deserve to be. And we continue talking about these things. And when you look at, for example, the resources that are being put in, in some of these uh, methods, in, 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 in some other research, 
you realize that there's quite a lot of resources going there. But why aren't we putting resources to where we strongly believe our hearts are and our energies are? So I think for me it is about the political commitment right from the international community to the lower levels of our government. And, and, and I think also there is a question of integration of services. We've been talking about this subject matter for quite long, but I also see a little bit of challenge in terms of, especially at country level, where this should be happening, being realized. And therefore, we continue debating these issues as if they were uh, different, as if we were talking about different people, and yet we are talking about the same person. Probably if the question of integration was put in, in its right place, and uh, given the due attention that it deserved, we probably would be at a different level in terms of dealing with some of these uh, problems. And I want to insist that there's no reason why we should be talking about the same woman, the same woman, as if they are different. We are talking about the same woman and one woman, for God's sake. But when it comes to policy, when it comes to programming, we are divided as if, you know, and I think for me that's where the whole problem comes from. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. And Chelsea, did you, were you trying to in weigh in on the issue of the, um, the broader family planning goals that would help address this issue? Yeah, I, I think um, people have said of a lot of, um, made a lot of really great comments. I just wanted to add into that, um, that I think one focus for the way forward really does need to be in, in looking at multi-purpose prevention technologies, which as Lillian is advocating for, you know, would, would help to address multiple um, health needs within a single product and, or a single intervention. Um, one other thing that I did want to address um, that, that Lillian had also brought up was she mentioned um, work around subcutaneous Depo-Provera. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, as we talk about expanding the method mix and ex expanding women's contraceptive choices around the world, particularly in areas where um, access is limited, we need to remember that we have we don't have evidence on depo sub Q in relation to HIV acquisition, progression, or transmission, just as we don't have ed evidence on several of the other available hormonal methods. And one thing that, that researchers are really trying to think about and, and sort through is whether any potential um, increase in risk that might be seen with DNPA um, may be related to the kind of large spike in hormones that occurs at the beginning of a shot, which then tails off over time. Whereas with other method, methods, such as implants, there's a there's a lower um, there's a lower dosage of hormones that occurs, um, and and which would be more similar to a lower dose method like Depo sub Q. So um, there's a lot of leading thinkers on this issue uh, um, who you know have some some thoughts around what the impact of the presence of hormones versus the actual dosage of hormones might be. So I don't think at this point we should kind of throw out um, possible options that both may provide a lower dose of hormones, which may or may not um, have similar impacts as, as other methods, and which also may help to expand access. So in some ways, you know, we need to continue to think about um, how to solve these problems together in one, in, in, one, or in actually a, a basket of methods for women so that they can make their own informed individual choice for the methods that work best for them. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, so we only have a few minutes left, but we have lots of questions coming in on two particular topics, gender and stigma. So I'm going to try to see if we can address both in the remaining time that we have. First on, on gender, we have a question for Lillian. Um, that says, while the WHO statement recommends that contraceptives that can and should be used by women at risk of and living with HIV, it does not address barriers that women often face to accessing and using contraception, including negotiating condom use. So what gender-focused programming strategies are needed to ensure that women are able to adopt the prevention recommendations that are set forth in the WHO statement? Lillian? Hi. 
So in terms of um, gender programming, I, I think it, it should even go beyond gender programming, but also uh, uh, to the level of, of policy. And uh, like I said in, um, in, in, in my speech, for me, I think we missed the point at that level when we made that uh, recommendation, and it's probably because we, we were getting narrow in terms of uh, where we wanted to go, but also where we were coming from. Because when you talk about use of condom, it's been an issue and it will continue to be an issue, especially for women, where we know that women can't even, in, in most parts of the world, cannot negotiate for safer sex where we know that women are not economically empowered to even when they want to use condoms, to be able to use condoms. So I think for me that is where the starting point would be. Look at what are some of the real issues, the causes that are hindering women, first of all, to access and use uh, condoms. What can we do in terms of programming to make sure that the programs we come up with are taking into consideration women and men, boys and girls. But also how can we, especially from the highest point of level, I think, where policies are made, how can we ensure that we are having gender sensitive uh, people at those policies, policy tables at those levels to make sure that whatever program is going to come up with, whatever research is going to be done, whatever is going to be funded, is gender sensitive. So for me, the gender sensitiveness has to start from the highest level and at international level, national, and it gets down to the grassroots where uh, programs are designed and implemented. So for me, I think that's what we need at all these levels. Thank you. Thanks, Lillian. We've come to the end of, of our time that we have for today's meeting. So I would like to encourage everybody to look for the archived version of this uh, session online. It will be available on FHI 360's YouTube channel probably by the end of this week. You can email me if you have any additional questions or comments because what I would like to do is include the few questions that we weren't able to get to today. I'll gather some responses to those and include it in the slide set on the, on the uh, online version. So please do email me if you have any additional thoughts that you would like to be included or addressed. And I want to sincerely thank all of our guest experts for taking the time to be with us today and to help us understand the, the really nuanced issues in this really important topic. Um, and thanks to everybody who made the time to participate. And thank you. Have a great rest of your day.